YouTube now. Somebody can watch YouTube first to see if she comes up. I'm um, watching. Uh, we were on for two minutes, 50 seconds. Yeah, this Something should be the new be one. Live. This should be us now. Uh, uh, click on the live feed here. And the live feed on Facebook. Okay, looking for a live stream on both uh, YouTube and Facebook. Looks like we're live on YouTube now. Video. I'm getting video. Yep. We're live on Facebook. Here we go. Hey, hello from Toronto. Perfect. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Peter. Welcome, guys. Waiting for it to update on Facebook. Facebook is still a little bit of choppy, folks, but uh, there are things on the works there to get us back to the normal. I promise. <laughs> I can hear the cogs ticking. Yeah. <laughs> Andrew, live on both. Thanks very much. And hello from Toronto, Peter. Peter's on both. Hey, Peter. I, Peter, I know it's a little bit choppy out there. We're, we're working on uh, my new PCs on its way, so we're going to have uh, this cleaned up as far as our Facebook feed goes, but uh, hopefully it's not too choppy for you. So anyway, folks, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday night astronomy show. Um, the reason why we were a little bit late this evening was I was doing some testing in the background uh, with using one PC to two, feed out two streams and uh, had all my settings at that level and didn't remember to take them back. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> Not much of a broadcaster here. Oh well, <laughs> I do my best. I'm really better at observing than I am, uh, or outreach than I am at this kind of stuff. But anyway, we're all here anyway. So first of all, I'd like to welcome back uh, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory in Hampton. Hey! Hello! Hey! <laughs> and, <laughs> and we have uh, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory in St. John. Hooray! Hooray! <laughs> Perfect. We've got that secret hand. We've got the single, secret uh, symbol going on. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so folks, tonight we have another uh, series of interesting astronomy topics for you again. Uh, we'll be starting, first of all, with a talk about what's up in space, as we do. Uh, we have been in the last number of weeks, I guess. Uh, then Paul's, I guess, Paul, Mike. Mike is going to present. Well, I'll just put, I'll just say these talks, but we don't know what order they're going in yet. We're really not sure. Uh, Paul's going to present a discussion around using your DSLR to capture the night sky. He's going to do a first part uh, segment, I guess, tonight, and... Uh, it's actually going to take a couple of weeks probably to cover at least. So we'll get into a 20-minute or so session tonight just to talk about that. Uh, after that, a uh, little bit of info on the upcoming big event coming up, uh, which is going to be uh, the great conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. We're going to talk a little bit about that coming up on the winter solstice this year. Uh, then Mike's going to uh, give us another popular Mike Giver episode um, where he'll be talking to us about how to safely view the sun and how to make your own solar filter. And following that, uh, Mike or uh, Paul has a, another short Rosanna's Fun Facts talk. And uh, both these talks from Mike and Paul have come from your suggestions. So uh, please keep those suggestions coming because uh, we, we like the ideas. Let's us uh, not have to sit there and think about it too much. Well, really we still think about it, but Facebook. yeah, we are chopping on Facebook. Okay. Um, yeah, I know that's because the, uh, the PC that I'm using for that has not been upgraded yet. Okay. Uh, of course, then we'll also have your wonderful photo submissions as well. So, and if we have time, we'll talk, uh, take a little uh, bit of a, rook, a look at the uh, night sky treasures for the week. So, uh, another pretty full show on the way. So, please sit back and enjoy. And remember, this is a live broadcast. So, if you have any questions about the night sky, we're happy to try and answer them for you. So, let's get started with a talk about what's new in space this week. I think it's kind of, uh, it's kind of uh, jumping back and forth on Facebook a bit, right? Yeah, I, have, I haven't listened to the audio, but some people were saying that it was good. Okay, yeah, so I'm not sure if it's my connection or um, if, they're, if they're getting a good stream, then it's probably me not uploading fast enough. Again, yeah. it's coming with the, uh, with the new PCs, going to clean all this up. Let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'll share my screen here first of all. And uh, we'll take a look at uh, a few things that are coming up uh, in the night sky. Well, not coming up, but what have happened, I guess, over the last week or so. Let's make sure we can get this photo up first of all. We got a photo there, have we? We yeah. do. We do. Perfect. Okay. Well, let's start out. Uh, Russian cosmonaut Ivan Wagner has captured some truly amazing views of Earth 
from above as seen from the International Space Station. But his latest capture, I'm going to try to zoom in here a bit, ooh, uh, of auroras included an unexpected surprise, five bright lights on the horizon that he dubbed space guests. Uh, they're likely satellites, not aliens, but still amazing to see for sure. The most likely culprit is a Starlink broadband satellite SpaceX launched on Tuesday, August the 18th, the day before Wagner um, shared his video. Although that has not been yet confirmed, so all the conspiracy theorists are out there right now. The footage of the five it is <laughs> the footage <laughs> of the five un unidentified objects flying over the southern hemisphere has been sent to experts in Russia for analysis. Ooh. Uh, satellites are the most likely answer, and it's something that the, on the International Space Station has, they have seen before. Well, back in April, spa uh, station astronauts spotted a train of Starlink satellites that looked very similar to this set of lights. And that's where we leave that one. And uh, this one, actually, is, I think I can scroll. No, can I? No, I can't scroll. What if I just open them up individually? There's another view of the uh, Aurora from the uh, space station. Wow, and there's awesome. the, the train. Is that the train satellites? I think so, yeah. Oh, right there, there, yeah. They're right yeah, there in the center. Are. Yeah, that's yeah. them, yeah. So I would probably suspect that's what they are. They're uh, Starlinks, but... Ooh, ooh, ooh. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is out there, guys. <laughs> not very high up. No, they're not. No, I guess they're... Well, maybe they were on their way up, right? They, they sit at about yeah. 400 kilometers up, I think, so... If it was a launch from last week, they wouldn't have been very high, I guess, to start with. Um, okay. A newly discovered car-sized asteroid just made the closest known flyby to Earth. And there's talk about another one coming up in November. I'll talk about that in a second. On Sunday, August the 16th, the asteroid initially labeled uh, ZTFODXQ. That sounds good. And now <laughs> formerly known to astronomers as 2020 QG. Uh, swooped by Earth at a mere 3,000 kilometers away, or one-tenth of the distance to the moon. Hmm. That uh, gives... Uh, is that one-tenth? No, that's that's one-one-hundredth. One-one-hundredth of the distance to the moon. That gives 2020 QG the title of the closest asteroid flyby ever recorded that didn't end with the space rock's demise. The flyby... <laughs> didn't hit us. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is a better way of saying it, right? Politically correct. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the flyby wasn't expected and took many by surprise. In fact, the Polymer Observatory didn't detect the zooming asteroid until about six hours after the object's closest approach. And that's what happens quite a bit. They don't get to see them really till they swing around the planet and say, oh, we missed that one. Um, the close flyby was also a fast one as 2020 QG swooped near Earth at a blistering 44,400 kilometers per hour. Wow. The object is about the size of a compact car, perhaps three to six meters in diameter. So, another close call. We made yes. it, though. Yeah, okay, next. Japan's asteroid sampling mission is officially cleared to return its precious cargo to Australia in December, according to statements from both countries' governments. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft is trekking back to Earth with a sample capsule full of material snagged from a near-Earth asteroid called Ryugu. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, which runs the mission, has long planned to deposit that capsule in the vast desert of Australia, but the new announcement marks the country's official approval of the plan. Over the course of its stay at Ryugu, Hayabusa 2 collected samples from the asteroid's rocky surface, shot the asteroid to create an artificial crater, and then collected some of the subsurface material uncovered by that impact as well. Amazing, eh? Hmm. The, the diversity of samples means that scientists will, will be able to learn more about Ryugu's interior and how it has responded to the harsh forces of outer space, like the solar wind, with a constant stream of highly en energized particles caused plasma flowing over the from off the sun. The Hayabusa 2 spacecraft will not return in full. It will only deposit a sample capsule back to Earth. Uh, JAXA, which is the Japan uh, agency, is evaluating sending the Hayabusa 2 probe on, on to visit a second asteroid about a decade from now. And finally, let's get to our last story here. Because we know we have a whole lot to go to. Hmm. Ooh. <laughs> NASA... Coming up here. here we go. NASA has supposedly photographed a boat on Mars. 
a boat. And intentionally tried to land its Curiosity rover near it, according to conspiracy theorists. UFO hunter, popular guy Scott Waring, spotted the boat in a NASA image and shared his view on his blog. Mr. Waring wrote on ET database, uh, as you see, the boat itself is just three meters away from the NASA rover landing spot. I think I'll bring that up in a second here. Um, that makes it a very suspicious landing location. Obviously, NASA knew about this ancient boat structure and deliberately landed the rover in this location because they are on a secret mission to retrieve alien technology. What do you think? Well, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> What if it's a there robot? Is. See, look. <laughs> look, it's pretty obvious. It's Gilligan's See? boat. <laughs> there it is there. Look, it's pretty obvious. Now, compare the size of the rover to the boat. It's a pretty I small boat. I'm looking for a boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all circled there. Look. Uh, he, says, uh, originally I, <laughs> he says, originally I found this back in 2016, but recently realized that this landing location couldn't possibly be a coincidence. NASA never chooses a landing spot on guests. They put a lot of thought and detailed analysis into finding this spot. Yes, but they do it for different reasons. Uh, they knew about that boat structure, and that is a sign of an ancient alien village location. However, skeptics and NASA uh, would say that the boat and other similar findings are just the effects of pareidolia, a psychological phenomenon when the brain tricks the eyes into seeing familiar objects or shapes in patterns or, or textures such as rock surfaces. Yeah. So that means there's water, there's water on Mars. I must think. Be. I think it must be. <laughs> there, no. there was. There was at one time until the boat went dry. That's what. That's what I'm getting at. <laughs> yeah. There's a better. There's a better picture. There it there's is. Rock, there's a Christmas tree on it too. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't that look like a boat? It sure. does. The Christmas tree in the front. <laughs> the Christmas tree in the front. <laughs> it's a Christmas boat. <laughs> there you go. There we go. Uh, in the past, Mr. Waring has also spotted Martian rocks, which he believes are part of an ancient structure that has been lost to time. Bizarrely, he said the archway, this archway, is the most likely minuscule, measuring no more than 45 centimeters in height. But um, more of the structure could be hidden under the rusty brown sands that have swept over the rock. Let's see if we can see that. Mm -hmm. There, see? That's what it really looks like. Oh, uh, yeah. <clears throat> I can see it now. Yeah. And he claims that he's also found uh, evidence of uh, a human uh, human being. Is that the one? Uh, let's see. Yeah, there it is. Yep. Uh, he claims that he's also found evidence of a humanoid life form, the supposed alien, which at first glance appears to be nothing more than a rock. At first glance. <laughs> uh, was highlighted by Mr. Waring in brown and yellow. Here, we'll bring it up here. Here's his picture <clears throat> that he highlighted. See, there you go. He said, oh, "Now this is this is pretty rare. It's not every day you find a humanoid body laying on the surface of an alien planet. That's for sure." Look more like a bug on a windshield. <laughs> <laughs> the body remains mostly intact and is definitely not a statue. So, I guess yeah. I'd leave it up to you. Yeah, that's that's yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's a yeah. <laughs> so, well, he's still got people out there looking. That's the main thing, right? Yes. The truth is out there. And I'll close my windows to make sure I don't close all my windows. Hey, they're here. They're back. And that's what we have uh, happening in the sky this week. Or oh, what was new in space this week. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> all right. What's up next? Let's, hey, uh, Mr. Mike. Oh, it's me. Mr. Mike. Hi, everybody. It's me. <laughs> Let's click, click uh, on the mic. Here. Looks like go. I get first dibs on second. <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> yeah. Who's on first? You're all set to go. I'm just going to move a couple of screens here like you guys do. No, I want to show this on share. Put you over here. Bring you up. Oh, I love that screensaver. Yeah, it's nice. Okay. What do we see? I think we see, see a picture of the sun. We do. Wow. When did you ever take that picture? You didn't know that. I've never well, seen that many spots. It's funny because the picture's kind of orangey gold and it's white light solar filters. So I messed up already because it's not white. Are some of those alien bases or? 
<laughs> That's morn delibnium neum. <laughs> Is that what you call, what do you call that when you see things in the clouds? <laughs> Pareidolia. That's it. Pareidolia. Pareidolia. <laughs> well, that, that, that's three pairs of sunspots. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it looks like a pterodactyl was just kind of walking across the sun. Yeah. bull legged one at that. Yeah. He was. <laughs> so what I wanted to talk about tonight was strictly that, just white light solar filters. I'm not going to get into, uh, like I was discussing with Paul earlier, uh, H-alpha telescopes or dedicated telescopes for looking at the sun or Herschel wedges or things like that. Just uh, the plain white light solar filters that you can purchase or build to put on top of your telescope. So you can see here in this quick shot, uh, the three, the three or four different ways that solar filters can be connected to your scope. It can be a full filter that goes right over the full aperture, or it could just be uh, like this one right in here uh, where you pop off the cap on your, your uh, telescope lid and uh, put some solar uh Monitor foam underneath it, and it gives you a solar filter. You can get them for binoculars, not just telescopes. You know, you can get them uh, any size you want. Uh, you can buy 80 millimeter, 70 millimeter, 50 millimeter, 30 millimeter, you name it. So you can uh, use white light solar viewing with binoculars, and they come with glasses that you can use for white light uh, solar viewing, such as if uh, you're watching an eclipse or a transit or something like that. You can get these glasses that are basically made of the, the same mylar that they use for the white light solar filters. So, what do you you know what are you getting when you buy yourself a solar filter? What are you looking for? Uh, individually, there's two really two different types. There's a glass and there's a like a film, a mylar film type made of a polymer, and it's your own personal choice which one uh, you want to get. Uh, glass ones are nice, but, uh, you know, they, they really got to be well taken care of. They, uh, you know, you don't want to go beating it around. If once you crack it or split it or break it or scratch it, you're done. A mylar, it's probably easier to fix or repair or replace. Uh, it's smaller, lighter. Uh, you know, I think the full glass ones are more expensive, but uh, do you really see anything different doing? I don't believe you do. The glass ones have a tendency to... Uh, especially the Thousand Oaks ones that, I, that I've that i owned, have a tendency to turn the sun a, an orange color or anywhere from a, almost a yellow to an orange color, where the film ones uh, send it out as a white light. Now, I've seen uh, people take uh, normal planetary filters and add that to their eyepieces to change the color because you will see different detail with different color and different contrasts. Uh, if you're looking at a white sun and you put in a blue filter, uh, you're going to start pulling out you know, granulations probably better, or you pull out filaments better and things like that. So, you know, it, it's not just using the white light filter. It's usually adding some kind of a one of your planetary filters or something along with it to bring out the detail when you're looking. What will you see when you use a white light filter? Well, you're going to see sunspots when there are sunspots. Right now, we're at a solar minimum, and uh, over the past couple of months or so, I've taken a few pictures, and there's been virtually nothing. I think I got one sunspot in a month. What does the sunspot look like when you look at it? What happens with the solar filters is they are eliminating 99.999% of the visible light coming through into your scope. So when you're looking at the sun and you see a sunspot like this one, uh, you see what's called the penumbra, which is the side, and the umbra, which is the, the center. And that's kind of like you're looking down into a hole in the sun, and it's cooler on the inside than it is on the outer surface. So the penumbra, or the penumbra is more like, uh, say, the sides of a crater going in, and then the umbra is the bottom of the crater, or you're looking in to where the bottom of the crater would be. You'll see granulations. And if you look really, really closely, you'll pick them up. It looks almost like water boiling on the surface, and you can watch it bubble back and forth almost. That's a, the closest thing I could equate it to was water bubbling. And then you will also see what's called facula, which if you look in the picture here, you'll see it's the little white bright lines in between uh, uh, granules and things like that. And they are, they are quite noticeable, these facula, when you look at it. 
And then the third thing, you'll, or another thing you'll see is what's called limb darkening, which is just the outer edge is going to be darker than, say, the center when, you, when you're looking at the sun as a whole. You know, and, and those are the kind of things you can see with a white light filter. You put uh, a camera on your telescope and start taking photographs. Uh, this quick one here was one that I took in 2011. It was sunspot number 1263. It was considered at the time to be one of the biggest sunspots of that year. Uh, and only that year. They've been a lot bigger and probably a lot smaller. But that particular one was uh, considered the largest one for that year. But again, if you look down uh, a little bit to the right-hand side, you'll see there's facula and whatnot in there as well and the granules. So you can see that in just a photograph. And then this photograph was taken by Paul and enhanced a bit. And it really brings out the detail. Uh, and that was just a white light filter, like you say, Paul, right? Yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, you can really see the beautiful sunspots, other parts starting to form. You can see all the facula on the edges. You can see the limb darkening here as opposed to the center over here. And you can see the granules. And watching all that live through a solar filter is just, it's an amazing thing to watch. The only thing that I think you could do to enhance it even more if you're just using a white light filter is to buy a solar continuum filter to go with it. And all that does is it just uh, it enhances everything in that photograph. It enhances the granules. It enhances uh, uh, the facula. It just makes the sunspot stand straight out. I don't know what they cost. Like a continuum filter is close to 100 bucks or something like that. It gives it like a greenish tinge. <laughs> but uh, what an amazing thing. Uh, addition, if you do go with a white light solar filter, if you want it down the road, add something to it, you could add a solar continuum filter. So that's quickly what you can see through a, a, a white light filter. When you're going to choose one, the first thing you want to do is stay away from these. You'll see them on eBay. You'll see them around, kicking around. It uh, screws onto your eyepiece and it says sun on it. That is not a solar filter. It's not even a good green uh, filter of any kind. That will inevitably destroy your eye and destroy your scope and everything else. <clears throat> What you first have to figure out is your solar filter has to go to the opening uh, or uh, the main light collecting area of your telescope where the light's coming in, not where it's coming out. Uh, you want to cover that front. If you don't cover that front and you point your scope at the sun, uh, if it's a refractor, you're going to burn yours to somebody else's eye out. If it's a reflector, uh, like I was discussing with Paul earlier, I saw somebody spin accidentally their... Uh, Dobsonian scope around during the daytime and it just so happened to line up with the sun and boy it started to smoke in literally seconds it didn't take long at all and that would be your eyeball in there stay away do not buy do not use never 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 use these sun filters that you see and uh, there's lots of them on eBay and there's lots of advertising around it and say buy me you'll love the views and you won't have much viewing done after you <laughs> use one I can guarantee you that so you want a proper filter. So when I say a proper filter, you want to go with reputable names like Thousand Oaks. They make the glass filters. Uh, they also make uh, the Mylar film filters as well. But they're a very good, reputable name. They've been around for a long time. Uh, their solar filters are really, really good. Kendrick is another name that's out there. Lots of people have Kendrick filters put on, and they're basically made with batter solar film. And uh, the batter Mylar solar film is considered to be some of the best out there. So if you're going to buy a solar filter from somebody, make sure it's a brand name filter or make sure it's somebody that you trust. And if it's a homemade one that they put together for you, it's made with batter solar film. Because there is a lot out there that is, you know, they try to sell it as a, as a safety of your eyes, but they're not. And you don't want to take that chance. You only get two mm -hmm. eyes. You don't want to burn one of them up at a star party. Uh, make sure that uh, I can't express enough. You buy uh, a reputable filter with a reputable name on it or, you know, uh, something that's using the batter solar film. And uh, even Celestron now uses batter solar film. Uh, most of the major companies, Orion and Vixen, are using batter solar filters. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, you don't need to have a store-bought one. There's lots of people out there that homemade them, and I'm one of them, but you can see it doesn't take much. There's a cardboard tube, a whole bunch of duct tape, <laughs> and a piece of mylar, 
uh, batter solar film in the center, and guess what? You're off to the races as long as it covers the whole front of the scope where all the light's coming in. You don't want to have any holes in it where any light can peek through. The sun is extremely bright, and the smallest skull is going to cause you damage. Here's one here where someone has taken basically the cap off uh, what looks like their Newtonian telescope. And uh, they just popped the top off one side, taped in a piece of uh, better solar film on the inside, and it gives you an off-access solar filter when you flip it over and stick it back on your scope. The good thing about the off-access one as well is that's cutting down the light even more. Uh, the sun is really, really bright. I know when I put my, my uh, filter on my nine and a quarter, it's still super, super bright. Uh, one of these off-access ones would probably be better for my nine and a quarter. And then you can see here another daub, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> where someone has made another off-axis filter for it. Now I get into one of my fits here. Here we go. This is white light solar viewing from St. Charles Beach. Uh, we were down there trying to come up with a method of doing uh, some public observing, keeping some social distancing in there. <coughs> so that's where the TVs came from. And I just decided to get down early, set up my scope, put the solar filter on the front, pointed it towards the sun, turned on the camera and I captured it right there just as it was going by a set of uh, power uh, towers. It was kind of a neat shot. Unfortunately, that day again, there was no uh, no sunspots of any kind. The sun is just dull as dull can be right now. I'm hoping we're at the bottom of that cycle when we start coming out of it. So that's it for the slideshow. I just uh, wanted to quickly show you there. And I'll stop sharing my screen. And I should be back here. You are. And uh, I'll just quickly show you some of the filters that I have. Not that I would have very many. <laughs> <laughs> no, never. <laughs> So <laughs> the first one I got right here to show you, this is a, this is a Kendrick uh, Mylar filter. This one's made for a 10 inch job, uh, very light. You see the Mylar has some wrinkles in it. You don't want it stretched tight. You want to have some slight wrinkling in it. Uh, if it's too tight, they say it, it doesn't allow the light to come through correctly. Uh, being wavy and flaky and a little bit uh, loose like that, is how you want the filter. There's nothing wrong with it. It's made to be that way. A little step down to a little bit smaller one. This is one by Celestron. And again, it's Mylar, and you can see that it's wrinkled as well, because that, that's the way they're supposed to be. This one just clips onto the outer inch of my nine and a quarter. And uh, I don't know if you can hear it, but it moves just like a sail in the wind, so to speak. But again, that's a Mylar one. Now, if some, for some reason, you do poke a pinhole in it, and you go, geez, that's not the end of my filter, I hope. You can actually go to the inside and put a piece of black tape just over that pinhole. And guess what? You've still got all kinds of solar filter to, to look at the sun, and you're not going to lose any of your views by it by any means. This type, this one's from my C8. This is a thousand oaks. This one is hard glass. And again, it, it, uh, it removes 99.999% of the sun's light. This one does have a tendency to show you an orange colored sun. It's kind of nice. And if you don't like it, you can always manipulate it in your photo software later if, if you're taking images of it. But you've got to watch with this one because where it's not, uh, not wrinkled, it's a perfect flat and it looks like a mirror. If by accident you point this the wrong way, you could reflect the sun down on somebody in your group. <laughs> so you got to be careful when you're using uh, these uh, hard glass ones. They are nice, good quality, but uh, you know, if I was to go by choice, I would probably buy the Mylar. It, uh, it's 
cheaper. It just seems to be uh, an easier way to go. Gross. Now, they're not all great big, Gross. huge yeah. filters. They're from right on down. This one here is for a 70 millimeter. This one here is for a 60 millimeter scope. Again, uh, this one's a Kendrick. This is a Thousand Oaks made with Mylar. Uh, and they're great. They go over your small refractors. As long as you, you know, put them on the right end, then uh, you're going to have safe, wonderful viewing. Then you get into, gee, the guys at the clubs are passing out some solar film, and they're making their own. I could do that. Well, my cats used to have a feeding cup <laughs> until uh, I cut a hole in it. <laughs> And if you cut the hole just a little bit smaller than, than the uh, diameter of the cup, that'll give you room on the inside. You can basically run a tube of glue on the inside, cut a circle piece of uh, the uh, solar film, and just stick it right in there. And now your cat bowl has been turned into a solar filter for your, I think this one goes over a 90 millimeter uh, mat cast that I have. And that's, a, that's one there, if you look on the inside here as well. It's had a couple of pinholes in it. And I've just touched it up with a couple of pieces of black tape. And it's uh, still a good working solar filter made out of my cat's feeding bowl. <laughs> uh, like I was showing in the film earlier, this one here is off a four inch uh, refractor. And all I did was you pop the cap off and I glued some Thousand Oaks solar paper on the inside. They make a Mylar paper type too. And uh, again, it gives you that orange uh, glow to the sun when you use the Thousand Oaks filter paper. But it was just a matter of taking the cap and gluing a piece on the inside. And once it's in there and you're done using it, you put the cap back on and nobody ever knew it was a solar filter on the end of your scope. It's just a dust cap. You pop it off and now you have a solar filter stuck right to your cap. The one that I showed you the picture of the beach is this one here on my 80 millimeter. <clears throat> this one was kind of cool because I was going through Value Village one day and I found a busted camera. I think I paid a dollar for it. And this was basically the camera lens. It unscrewed off. I took it apart, put the uh, solar film on the inside, tightened the top on, took a razor blade, and cut it all the way around, and it screwed right onto my 80 millimeter cap. <laughs> for my uh, Orion 80 millimeter <laughs> scope and uh, it works like a charm and it's always there and uh, I believe that was a, a Lex no what's it called I can't remember the name now that was a high-end camera but uh, for a couple of dollars I took the broken camera and it actually fit right on there like it was made for it so you know keep your eyes open look around I see things different when I go into stores and that's just one of those things that I saw you can take the camera lens screw the mylar to it and then uh, you get yourself a wonderful solar cap another one i did was i 3d printed a solar <coughs> filter excuse me for my six inch uh, smith castle grain it prints in uh, two pieces basically there's uh, the bottom ring which is the part that slides onto your sco uh, scope and there's a, a top ring you can see. It's about, uh, oh, maybe two millimeters uh, thick. And all you do is you put your solar film on, glue it down, take the top ring, glue it down on top, and then they're all stuck together. This one, uh, according to the design for the 3D print, was to have four screws holding it together. But I didn't like the fact that the screws were actually coming through and could touch my scope. They would scratch the paint or scratch the glass. So I took the screws out after I glued it. I just put four little rubber nibs over the holes so that the light wouldn't get through. And for about uh, three and a half hours of printing, you basically made yourself a, a solar filter for your C6. Uh, my printer only, that's about the largest I could print on it. I can't print eight or 10 or 12 inch, but uh, I printed, that was a nice, nice turnout, that C6. Again, if you uh, have a Newtonian scope or a daub and you have one of these uh, caps that have the off access hole, then basically all you have to do is turn to the inside and tape a piece of uh, Mylar uh, solar film over that hole and you've got yourself an off access solar filter 
made just from the cap that they supplied with your telescope. So talk to the people in the club. I had some around here somewhere. I was going to show you how to cut it and tape it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I put it in a safe spot and I can't find it. <laughs> but uh, it's just one of those things. <clears throat> now, it's not just for telescopes. You can do solar viewing with binoculars. And this was a cool thing that I found. And these were off eBay, but they're a reputable firm that makes them. And it's basically a pair of stretchy rubber solar filters. Now, these are made to go over 50 millimeter uh, binoculars. So if you've got a pair of 10 by 50s, there's a, a great pair of uh, solar filters that you can buy. And I think they were $23, believe it or not, <coughs> for, the, for the set. <clears throat> and if you're out doing solar viewing and say you have your C8 with you and you forgot to take the 50 millimeter finder scope off and you get looking at the sun and all of a sudden you find your shoulders getting pretty hot, that's probably because you didn't put the cap on the 50 millimeter solar or the 50 millimeter finder scope. One of these rubber ones will stretch right over and fit your 50 millimeter finder scope. And now you've got a solar finder, finder scope, solar finder. <laughs> you put all those words together. So they're, they're the you can buy. And I came across these a while back. And I thought this was one of the greatest things for doing quick viewing, solar safe solar viewing in white light. And these are a pair of 32 millimeter binoculars made by Lunt. And anybody that's been around the ballpark knows that Lunt is a very good name in uh, solar scopes and whatnot. It's got uh, the glass filters in the front. They are eight power by 32 millimeter. And uh, they are specifically designed for watching transits or eclipses or even just looking around and looking for sunspots. And there's specific binoculars for white light solar viewing, and they cost about, uh, I think they're running now about 70 bucks. But that's great, great pair to have right there if you want to do some safe solar viewing from a very reputable company, Lunt, when it comes to uh, solar equipment. Uh, they put them out there at a good price. And last but not least, we get down to the... Uh, White light solar filters that they supply, uh, usually when there's going to be a, a transit across the sun, like Mercury, Venus, or something like that, or we're going to have a solar eclipse of some sort, uh, they come up with these solar glasses. Again, you want to be careful. Uh, there's probably a lot of counterfeit junk out there. Uh, you want to look and make sure they're, you know, you get them from a reputable source. This pair right here has the Royal Canadian Astronomy Society symbol on them. And they were literally uh, put out by RAS Canada. And so you know they're going to be a good pair uh, of uh, white light solar viewing glasses to look for sunspots or watching a transit or watching an eclipse. And I believe these ones come out for the last transit, didn't they, Chris? These uh, or the last eclipse. They're called the eclipse glasses. Yeah, they, uh, they did it. That was the last bunch that was coming out. And, again, they were okayed by... Uh, by Rask, and so you, you knew that you were getting a reputable pair and you weren't going to get some Chinese knockoff that if you look at the sun was going to burn your face off. But uh, that's another good, you know, way to go. They're simple, they're cardboard, they're white light. Uh, most of the clubs have them and pass them out. And, uh, you know, you can only keep them for three years. Uh, they're probably good after that, but they suggest that after three years, you throw them away and get another pair. And also, so, I guess if you were... Uh... You were selected as a double for uh, an Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator movie. You could probably wear them. Yeah, that would They'd be too. good for that. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. So anyway, that's uh, that's a uh, quick and short of it. Uh, you know, uh, white light solar viewing is is really fun. There's a lot to look at, a lot to see. Just make sure that uh, you know you buy a reputable filter if you get one, or you get uh, your solar film from a reputable source, like a club member or something like that. Uh, I'm not into this whole welder's glass thing. Uh, these white light filters are specifically built to keep that light out of your eye and you know keep your eyes from getting damaged. So you wanna make sure that either you're buying a reputable name or you are getting your uh, 
solar film from a reputable source. So that's all I can say. Perfect. Thanks, Mike. Awesome. Awesome stuff. I'm going to mention this just like I know that we're on Facebook right now, but uh, if there are people who are having trouble with the uh, choppiness, it is uh, up on YouTube and it seems to be solid on YouTube. So um, it is because I'm running two different laptops and one needs to be upgraded badly, which is going to be replaced shortly. So if uh, you folks want to uh, catch the stream and you're not getting all the information that you want, you can flip over to YouTube, to my YouTube channel, and we're live up there as well. So just as a, a comment up really do apologize for the uh, for the choppiness but it seems like I'm stuck until I get my new life my new PC but thanks Mike so much for that that's uh, lots of great information there and always make sure you're using a solar filter when you're peeking at the Sun and don't be afraid to try to make your own uh, yeah you know, <laughs> as long as it covers the aperture one way or the other it doesn't matter what it looks like when you're getting into the, like the eight or ten inch scopes anywhere six eight or ten i mean you uh, an off axis i guess is probably enough because the sun's so bright right yeah absolutely hmm. the one find thing that, I, sorry mike no that's okay i was gonna say find that one with the off axis cap hole and we'll just pop the cap off and stick some filter paper on the inside yeah uh we've got a comment here is there a direction to the mylar film that is does a specific side have to face the sun and i don't think uh i don't believe so no not necessarily, no. Well, put it this way. I've never looked, and I don't think I've gotten it right every time, the same side. So I can guarantee it's uh, it's not uh, – it doesn't have any ill effects if you do put it in backwards. Right. <laughs> um, Stefan had asked, uh, when is the next eclipse we can see? So, Stefan, that's going to be next uh, June, June the 10th of 2021. We'll have about a 75 to 80% eclipsed uh, sunrise, actually. As the sun rises, the sun will be eclipsed. Uh, here in St. John, anyway, it's about 78 to 80 percent, which is pretty nice. Uh, but the next big one is going to be uh, the total solar eclipse coming up on April the 8th of 2024, not very far away. Um, and that's going to pass right over New Brunswick, and we're going to have a total uh, totality in New Brunswick about three minutes long uh, in some places in New Brunswick, uh, passing from about Fredericton up to about uh, Newcastle, a strip right across the center of the province. So that's one April the 8th. Hoping for good weather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no snow. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, all we can do is hope for the best. But uh, it is going to be one of the best places in, in – uh, it's coming right up the uh, the, the uh, seaboard. Actually, they're calling it the second Great American Eclipse. So it's coming up the uh, the northeastern seaboard right across us. Uh, so, But we're going to have the, book the best uh, the best length of time. So we should get a lot of visitors here in the, in the province based on the fact that this is going to be a big show. So. So that's what's coming up. So we got a good practice run in uh, June the 10th, 2021. I do have a page up actually too, a Facebook page called the New Brunswick 2024 Solar Eclipse. Uh, if you wanted to go uh, follow that, I'm trying to keep that updated as far as uh, as new events come up. So uh, this Jupiter-Saturn conjunction, I'll be putting that up there. Anything that's coming up, new transits, that kind of thing. In preparation for the, the lead up to the, to the uh, NB Solar Eclipse. Because somebody had asked me, can I find any information on about it? And I looked for it, and I couldn't find any. So I said, well, create a page. So I did. <laughs> so Great. there's a Facebook page up there for people who want to go join it. And, uh, as of course, as we get closer and closer to the next big event, I'll be posting more and more information. Perfect. Thanks so much, Mike. Great yeah. talk. Another great talk. Um, click, click off me. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> okay. Um, so where do we want to go next? Paul? You ready? Oh, sorry. Hello. I'm back. Hey, how you doing? Glad to have I you was, back. Uh, well, no, I went. I, I happen to have some of the Bader solar film here. Oh, perfect. And so, there I, go. I, so I want to check and see uh, if there was a right side or a wrong side. But Mike, uh, there's nothing here whatsoever that says you have to use one side or the other. So. Yeah, I don't remember it reading yeah. it. I flipped yeah. them obviously around. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so you're good to go either way. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. So before we click off, Mike, I just want to see if everybody's catching that water cooler talk going on in the background there. Mike. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the coolest thing. We're going to have a little contest coming up here because we're going to get people to go back and tell me what's happened in every episode because all the characters in the background there, those two characters have changed position and there's been something different about them in every single episode. So uh, we're going to post up a nice little contest with a prize or something. To, for those who can uh, come back and spot them. 
Uh, this is somebody, fire. Somebody did tonight, actually. Or did I miss that? Did you, did you say that and I missed it? Yeah, somebody did talk about Cooler Talk or something here tonight. Yeah. Oh, did they? Okay. Yeah, they did. Yeah, yeah, it was Janet, I think. Yeah, they're on the oh, Cooler right uh, Sycamore is asking, does the Botter film have an expiry date as well? Uh, not um, There was nothing on expiry that I read on my copy. I haven't opened it up and looked inside. Okay. But all the stuff on the um, on instructions are on the back, and what it is is on the front, and there's no expiry date on either side. So. Okay, and Lou is asking, uh, did, you, did you design the 3D printed part, Mike? Is the design freely available? Uh, no, you can go on a website called Thingiverse. And uh, it's free uh, to download all the, uh, the, uh, the 3D things you can get off of that site for astronomy. It's, it's unfathomable. There's so much stuff. And you just, uh, I searched in, I, I looked for a solar filter for a six inch scope. And boom, there it was. And Thingiverse, you can download the software for free and fire it on your printer, and away you go. You'll have it in about three hours. Perfect. Great. Thanks so much. Okay, I think that's a, that takes care of all the questions. Uh, Andrew says, uh, hopefully COVID will be over by then. Let's hope, Andrew. Yeah. yeah, it's been a pretty tough year for all of us for doing outreach. This is the only outreach we've really been able to be been able to offer this year. So uh, we're all looking forward to it for for many reasons, of course. Okay, um, Paul, are you ready for your Rosanna's fun facts? Or I am. Believe you are. Or not. Let me see if I, I am. am. I I'm think just I am to too. See if you are. I think I am. Uh, I'm gonna mute my mic just for a second, and I'll and I'll do a sample just a sec. Okay. No, I think I can. I think I can. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I might have muted my mic, but I can still hear you. <laughs> oh, okay, I think we're ready, Paul. Let's see. Okay, just uh, a second. And we're uh, waiting for um. What are we waiting for? Okay, so we're this waiting for is. is Fun fact. Hey! <laughs> timing was great, Yay! Peter. Welcome back, Rosanna. Peter must be getting Peter must be getting proud of us, I think, at this point. <laughs> well, we, 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 we missed her last week. <clears throat> and so this week we're gonna she sent me something kind of cool, really. And um, let me just see if I can find out where it is. And it's right here first. Actually, I'll pull it up on a sticky note. There. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this uh, this week's Rosanna's fun fact is about UFOs. So, um, so the United States deems UFOs a national security threat. Why is Canada not taking it as seriously? So, whether one believes in UFOs or what they may actually be or not is an endless discussion, but the fun fact to Rosanna is it, she didn't know that approximately two years ago, the United States Navy decided and was pleaded with that the general public to please stop calling things you see that are flying, but you don't know what they are, UFOs, but they are unidentified flying objects. So what are we supposed to call them? They are now teamed UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. I didn't know this. UAP, in my experience, is always meant to trip to Napa for auto parts. Funnily enough, searching UAP brings up unlicensed assistive personal, personnel, among other things. A search of UFO brings up an accepted dictionary definition of a mysterious object seen in the sky for which it is claimed no orthodox scientific explanation can be found. But just like Pluto no longer can be listed as a planet, UFO, UFOs now must be termed UAPs. So if you are a fan of UFOs, so are UAPs, check out the article. It has a lots of up-to-date stats on sightings, near misses, and other great stuff. And this link, by the way, and the article was uh, sent through to us by uh, Lauren Deltrup. Thank you, our Deltrup. Thank you, Lauren, for sending that in. And on the bottom of this little slide, there is a link, and you can actually go and read that whole article. It's actually quite interesting. I don't know if you can see it there. You should be able to see it's big enough. Um, if you play this back, just take your camera, cell phone, just click on it. You can pick up that link, and then you can just put it in and then have a look at it. So that 
is this week's just a second oh come on now i was all ready to go i know you were <laughs> rosanna's rosanna's fun fact <laughs> <laughs> thank you rosanna for an awesome awesome. awesome fun fact thanks so much Peter Bisma, we, we please understand that we're never laughing at your uh, your uh, your music here or your intro. It's always us and, and our timing. <laughs> we're like bad comedians. Yeah, we are, but we do appreciate the, you sending us those those, those files for sure. Yeah, it makes a show. <laughs> okay, it thanks is. so much, Paul, yeah. for that. And uh, like where do we want to go now? now? You're gonna um, do pictures. I'm gonna do pictures. Okay gonna do uh, do 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 he do pictures hang on a sec okay let's see what's uh going on here all right uh get my photos ready and i'll share my screen drift off into that uh oblivion there again for a second oh yes oh why have i got two of you up here paul that must be it. Yeah. <laughs> what a pleasure. <laughs> okay, we're still on full screen on Facebook. Okay, so let's go. Um, all right, photos. Just uh, give me a second. I get my notes here. Do, 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 do. Da, 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 da. Can you guys talk amongst yourselves for a second? Yes. Sure. Uh, oh, I was going to say it. If I didn't already here. say it, I'll say here. it again because my, my memory's so short. When you use solar, your solar filter each time, inspect it before you use it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, um, because lots of times you might poke a hole during transportation, think that it's safe, go ahead to use it again, and now there's a hole in it. So, you know, make sure that you do uh, definitely inspect it before you use it. And never put it on with your scope facing the sun. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yes. laughs> Somebody's done that that we know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Andrew and okay. hey, Paul. Huh? <laughs> uh, Peter says, "Really, really tight production on the audio. You make me laugh every week." <laughs> that's great. That's great, Peter, because we make ourselves laugh every week too. <laughs> we appreciate the support. Um, Andrew and Tiffany Seven sent this one in. Said, "Hi, we're still oh. learning how to take pictures of the moon, but liked this one." Uh, he says, "My yeah. wife took this." In August, on, on August the 21st with an Icon 3100 in our backyard. Thanks very much, Andrew Saban. Beautiful shot. Yes. Very well done. Very nice. Um, now we have a shot from Carol Bean. Uh, Carol Good. says, this is the Big Dipper from above Greens Point Lighthouse last night, which would have been uh, the other night, I guess. So. Beautiful Big shot. Dipper sitting above the, yeah. Mm. Look at the, nice my, photos. Um, Mizar and Elcor stand right out, eh? Let's bring that in. Ooh. Hey, look at that. There they are. There boom, boom. Beautiful. So, so there, folks are, aren't sure, there is a an optical double sitting here, the second star in on the handle of the Big Dipper. See if you can pick it out naked eye. Uh, it is a pretty sight through binoculars and pretty through a telescope, but even pretty uh, naked eye. So that does stand right out. Very nice. Does. Cool. All right. Thank you, Carol. And uh, we've got another one here from uh, Cheryl. Cheryl sent this one in tonight. Oh, um, she's, uh, yeah, like Hi, yeah, Chris. Yeah. She says, took this last night, which is last night, I guess. It just happened to look up, and there was the moon between the trees. Uh, she says, you're keeping us all well informed as to what's going on over our heads in the beautiful night sky. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you, Cheryl, for that. Beautiful mm -hmm. shot. Start to see the Terminator line there, just barely. But some little bit of a detail there. And always nice to see cradled in the trees, eh? Oh, my, yeah. Uh, I've got this one on my Facebook page um, from Maggie. Maggie says, uh, these are some photos that my husband took the other night, and I thought you would appreciate them. Taken from the north side of Fredericton, August the 17th, a photo was taken on my Samsung Galaxy S20 5G oh. and edited in Snapseed. Can you see Andromeda? Uh, is there? Yeah. Oh, right up here. Look at that. Yeah, there it is. Oh, look at that. Nice, nice job. Yeah. And that's with the phone. That's amazing what it can do that's, now. That's the new Samsung's S20. They're getting better than that Huawei phone I got, for sure. 
Beautiful. That's one shot. Uh, she sent me a few here, so I'll just scroll through them. There's another one. Different lighting, of course. Must mm -hmm. use the... Uh, what's that filter, Mike, that you use for the blue light? Tungsten. Tungsten. There it is. Yeah. And there's a nice one there. Oh, I like that. Very I'd nice. say that's probably Jupiter. Nice. Love the mm -hmm. color. Yeah. yeah. Looks like the trees are kind of surrounded with them. Look, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's what I want to talk about next. So uh, that's what we had for photos, but I do want to mention the current Shoot the Moon contest. Uh, that's why I've got this photo, I think, from Andrew and a few others tonight. Uh, is the fact that we do have the Shoot the Moon contest going on right now, so I'm asking for people to submit their photos. Uh, I don't care what you take the photo with. Just take a photo of the moon, your cheapest s s uh, smartphone or cell phone picture, your cheapest camera. Send it into my page, my Facebook page, I'm listing them all together, or you can send it into our page here. I'll show you the address in a second. And uh, when you submit your photo, you get an entry into the contest. Um, if you submit a photo of the planets that are out right now, Jupiter, Saturn, or Mars, and even Venus in the morning sky, any one of those will qualify you for a second entry, which will put you into the draw. The, uh, the Shoot the Moon part of the contest is going to offer these three sets of binoculars here with three, three uh, complimentary books that go along with them. Uh, they're from uh, Next Dome Observatories, from Mr. Babak Sadehi, and uh, also from uh, John Reed from uh, Halifax. John does the 50 Things a series of books, great books for, for beginners and advanced as well. Uh, so we've got 50 Things to See with a Telescope, 50 Things to See uh, with a Telescope Workbook, and uh, 50 Things to See in the Moon. Then the other uh, two pairs, two sets of binoculars at the end here will be offered for the planets uh, portion of the contest. So you may get an entry in the, in the moon one, and a lot of people might do that, but you may think, hey, you know something? There probably aren't a lot of people who are going to submit a photo for planets, so I'll put it in that. You get Your odds are better. And I'm also going to offer a small book to go along with it called the 2020 Guide to the Night Sky with the uh, with the other two sets of binoculars. So some really nice prizes. The contest doesn't end until September the 10th, so you get lots of time. We've had some really clear skies, guys, last, uh, last little bit. It looks like yes, there's some clear skies coming up over the next yeah. week or so. So yeah. we've got it right up until the third quarter moon. So uh, when the moon sets after midnight, that's the night that the contest ends because that really carries you into the next day. So. But that gives us, uh, we're not even at first quarter yet, that doesn't arrive till Tuesday. So we've got the full week before we get to the full moon, another full week before we get to the third quarter moon. So lots of time to submit your photos. I love getting the photos. I'm going to put them all up in a gallery when it's all said and done. And you can go in and make sure that I've captured your photo. And we'll do the contrast draw on September 11th. Could uh, either of you guys show the picture you guys took of the, uh, was it a 4% moon or something? Oh, uh got that or not uh, i'll just offer this here first of all sunday night astronomy show sunday night astronomy show at gmail.com there's the address if you'd like to send us in your photos we would love to get them um and we'd love to show them on the show and also if you've got a moon capture or a or a planet capture that you want to enter in the contest you're not on facebook you can enter them in this way as well and i'll capture them from that and bring them out onto uh into the contest page let me take a look here paul if i can find it yeah i'm just pulling right. it up here now okay so uh, what we're waiting on is uh, both Mike and Chris went out um, towards the beach on the night that the moon was going to be. It's a 4%. Is that what it was? 4% illuminated? Uh, uh, no, it was, less no, than 1%. It was less than 1%. Yeah. Oh, one, less than 1%. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, I, I, I couldn't find it out, out here in Hampton. I got, uh, there was low clouds. So I was hoping they got it. And what a spectacle. Here. What a spectacle. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it's a to nice, do that, and it's such a challenge because it's a really, really good way for you to learn how to use the planetary software to know exactly where the moon was going to be. And these guys obviously did. Or at least I'm assuming they did. You see that? Right? Yeah. Yep. We do. Yep. Yep. And there's a sliver there. That is unbelievable. That is so hard because you can't see that with a naked eye. No, we couldn't. No, we couldn't. No. And, uh, it was only up for what, 15 minutes, Chris? When by the time we yeah. seen it to the time it set? Yeah, just above the yeah. hill right there uh, for 15 minutes at most. Yeah, just it was sliver. very tough. Mike caught it first. Uh, he just kept panning. I kept panning the sky too. Kept looking, but Mike's eyes were a little better, so he picked it out quick. And uh, we we get a look at it, spun the the uh, telescope around to it. I went on live on Facebook to offer it, and uh, it was a nice nice capture. Um, I think we got it last month too, didn't we, Mike? 
Yes, we did. Might, it may be I don't even know the month if it before. Was that, that, I don't know if it was actually that small or if it was a little bit bigger. It might have been a little bit bigger. Yeah, this was yeah, the, this was the was smallest one. Yeah. So uh, Dave McCashin commented back that it was a 21-hour moon. Um, wow. So that's, yeah. Uh, he said to get under 24 hours apparently is pretty good. So we were really yeah. lucky. I mean, we just had the conditions there, right? We had this cloud that was passing by. We said, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, always just in that one spot of the sky, this big cloud, right? Everywhere else, yeah. you know, look over to our right, it was all clear. And, but, but, you know, uh, um, being that close to the horizon, you also get that nice refracted light to give you that nice ter um, tequila sunrise kind of oh, a Oh, the colors background. are beautiful. Like, yeah. it couldn't have been a, a better condition to get that shot. That's true, yeah. Oh. It did turn out really nice. That was pretty that was cool, beautiful. Mike. It's a lot of fun to do that, like the first night of the uh, of the lunar cycle. Try to get out and get a capture of the moon. Um, if your skies are clear, it's a really nice challenge to pan back and forth with your binoculars and see if you can you can pick it up. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so uh, where am I at now? I'm stop my screen uh, here. Well, you yeah. might as well continue on and do because you, you wanted to do space uh, coming up this week. Oh, right. And that uh, kind of stuff, and um, and I'll do I'll do my segment starting next week. Are you sure? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh. There. Uh, okay. Well, let the. Uh, hang on a second, then I'll get my other set of notes here. Okay. So let's. Uh, what I want to do first is talk a little bit about um, the conjunction coming up. Paul, we can go right ahead with your talk. I can. I can carry this one on to next week. No problem at all. Oh no 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 no! Because like, like we're already quarter after almost. And oh, we are. Okay. Yeah. So you're gonna need yeah. more time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just give me a second here. I'll get to my PowerPoint. I think it's this one. Okay, so here's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, see if we can switch my uh, slideshow, start from the beginning. I'd like to switch my uh, display settings. Yeah, that should give it to us. We good yeah, there? Good. Yeah. Okay, so just talk a little bit about the great conjunction of 2020 coming up. Um, this is going to be one of the events I'll post up on my um, solar uh, observing page there as well, the solar eclipse page. But I'm bringing this up at this time simply because we've got a few months now to lead into this uh, this event, and it is a pretty big event. Um, it's an actual special event coming near the end of this year. We call it the Great Conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. So now, uh, what is a conjunction? Well, a conjunction in astronomy it's, occurs when any two astronomical objects, such as asteroids, moons, or planets, stars, uh, appear to be close together in the sky as observed from Earth. Uh, this one is going to occur on December the 21st, which is, the, of course, the winter solstice, the first day of winter. Okay, well, uh, here's the monthly breakdown of what we're going to see in the sky. So this this uh, only happens every uh, 400 years. Last time this happened was 1623. So I wasn't around for that one, but uh, maybe you guys were. Not me. No, okay. I was a little late. Huh? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> um, again, we're discussing this now because uh, watching these two planets uh, slowly approach each other, over the next little while will be, will be almost as fascinating as watching the conjunction itself. So on September the 21st, here's where we start. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn will be about 7.9 degrees apart. They're about 8.5, almost 9 degrees apart right at the moment. Uh, so that's on September the 21st, looking south at about 9 p.m. Uh, as we get into uh, October, they're down to 6.4 degrees apart. And when we get into November, now we've tightened that uh, rate up to 3.2 degrees apart. And then on the big day, December the 21st, they're going to be less than 0 0.1 of a degree apart. So they're going to appear almost like one object in the sky with your naked eye, as you can see here. Um, this is the closest conjunction since 1623, uh, from our point of view. We've had, we've had, we have other conjunctions every 20 years or so, but uh, this is the closest one. <clears throat> now, what is a degree? Okay, well, here's a, here's a f little bit of an idea of what degrees mean in the sky. So we've got 180 degrees from horizon to horizon, of course. If we take our thumb and our 
our uh, pinky finger and stretch them out. That'll cover the area of the Big Dipper roughly, which is about 25 degrees. Our two fingers spread out index and pinky finger about 15 degrees. Right down to the very end here with one pinky finger is one degree. So Jupiter and Saturn are going to sit in an area that would be one-tenth as wide as your pinky finger stretched out at the end of your arm. So pretty close and appear basically as one as one uh, planet. Of course, the conjunction itself would be dazzling with Jupiter shining at about uh, magnitude uh, Jupiter shining at about magnitude minus 2 and uh, Saturn at about 0.6. Remember, the lower the magnitude, the brighter the object. So Sirius in, the, in our night sky, um, the brightest star in the night sky, shines at about magnitude minus 1.46. So uh, Jupiter will be even brighter than that. As you watch Jupiter and Saturn get closer over the next three months, you might get the feeling that they're moving toward each other. This is another view, sorry, through a, through a Celestron C5 scope and a 12 millimeter eyepiece. This is what we'll view through a small Celestron telescope and a 12 millimeter eyepiece. Here's Jupiter, four of its moons. There's Saturn and some of its moons, all lumped together in your same field of view. Uh, there's Sirius again, the brightest star, shining at about minus 1.46. As you watch Jupiter and Saturn get closer over the next three months, you might get the feeling that they're moving toward each other. But in fact, they're actually moving in the same direction. Jupiter is uh, chasing uh, Saturn. Jupiter's 12-year orbit is inside Saturn's 30-year orbit. So Jupiter's moving faster at about 46,777 kilometers per hour for Jupiter compared to 34,645 kilometers per hour for Saturn. Kind of like a race around the track with a runner on the inside lane closing the gap on the slower runner that got a head start. And adding to the show, this extraordinary event is taking place in the best part of the sky. Uh, the center of the Milky Way between the constellations of Capricorn and Sagittarius. So not only do we get to watch this very cool event, we also get to watch it with a spectacular backdrop. Um, in other words, it's not just the event, it's actually where it's taking place as well. So Jupiter and Saturn are only in conjunction once every 20 years. So after the Great Conjunction on December the 21st, the two gas giants will slowly move apart through the 2020s as the faster Jupiter races around ahead of Saturn. And then through 2030, Jupiter will be... Uh, I'm not clicked on myself here on Facebook. There we go. Uh, Jupiter will be uh, uh, begin to catch up to Saturn until the next Great Conjunction in October of 2040 and so on into April of 2060, then March of 2080, and September of 2100. By pure coincidence, the Great Conjunction of 2020 occurs on the winter solstice, which marks the beginning of winter. So keep your eyes looking up over the next few months and witness something that hasn't, have, hasn't been witnessed in almost 400 years. It's a wonderful way now to uh, end the magnificent planet show that we've had uh, going all year long here. So, so that's the story on... Uh, on the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. You're going to hear a whole lot about this in the news coming up uh, very very shortly. The Great Conjunction. And that's what I get to say about that. Hello? Hello! <laughs> Did everybody fall asleep? <laughs> I'm back. No. Okay. No, actually, uh, everybody's uh, uh, answering questions. There's people talking and okay. sending stuff in. And, All right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Good. We, uh, we got an idea. I know there's going to be four feet of flurries that day on December. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah we're, we're, I mean, we've got a June the 10th event coming up at sunrise on the uh, of next year, June the 10th. And uh, that, you know, uh, I don't know. Just we we hope for the best. We know somewhere, probably somewhere, somebody is looking at it. So we just hope for them. <laughs> and we'll get our yeah. chance when our chance comes along. So that's why it's always important yeah. to get out and enjoy the night sky because we never get an opportunity to see it that that good very often. So okay. So from there, um, Paul, what are you? Are you you're not gonna. So we're gonna carry on with you next week, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Paul's going to do a discussion on shooting the night sky with a DSLR. Maybe we'll take the whole topic with you, Paul, next week. How's that? Oh, it's what, whatever's, whatever's good. I'm yeah. always good. I'm here. Okay. 
Uh, well, let's take a look at what's coming up in the night sky. Then we only got a little bit left, I guess. So we're we going for time. Uh, we're 20 after. 20 after. Okay. Let's see if I can uh, share my screen once more. And I'll, we'll take a quick look at uh, what's up in the night sky this week. Just a very quick look. Uh, we'll start slideshow from beginning again. And I want to swap uh, views. So I'll be on there. Views, really so. All right, just a very quick look of, at what's up uh, this week in the night sky. And really, I wanted to look at something that we can all pretty well relate to is, is binocular targets. So um, if you have a set of binoculars around and uh, they're just gathering dust, uh, throw them in your car and get outside and travel to a spot where it's uh, not necessarily really dark, but where you can get to a spot where you can get a nice view of the night sky. And uh, use your binoculars because binoculars really are just two telescopes joined together. And they're a perfect way to get started in the hobby perfect way to, to scan the night sky and take a look around at, at different objects that we can see. So let's just look at a couple of them that we can see this week. Of course, we've got our moon this week is going to be uh, at, uh, it's back in our evening sky now. It reaches its first first quarter moon on Tuesday night as it visits the three stars of the claw in Scorpius here. It's a perfect time really to be glancing at the moon with binoculars. So you uh, check out that line we call the Terminator that runs uh, this way. It separates day and night on the moon where the longest shadows are cast. Um, if you haven't used binoculars to check out the moon, then you're really missing one of the best shows in, in the sky, really, with the, with the set of binoculars. It's amazing the detail you can pick up with just binoculars or a small telescope on the moon. Um, while you're there, be sure and check out the bright reddish star Antares that sits right there as the as the eye of, uh, or that's the heart, or the eye? That's the eye, isn't it? Of the, yeah. of the scorpion. Eye of the scorpion. There we go. Antares is a, a huge red giant star. It's about 640 light years away. And Antares is actually the Greek uh, word for the rival of Mars. So Antares and Mars appeared the same color in, in the sky back when the early Greeks were looking at the sky. Um, so that's why I got the name Antares. So Aries is, is Mars and then Antares is the rival of Mars. And uh, then by Thursday, our waxing moon uh, meets up with Jupiter in our southeastern sky. Uh, check it out with Jupiter with binoculars, and you'll usually get to see four moons, uh, Io, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These are the four Galilean moons that were discovered by Galileo back in 1610. Um, and that's only four of 79 known moons. So you'll get those four for sure. The other ones are a lot tougher. On Friday, really, our moon sits... Uh, to the east of Jupiter and Saturn, and it makes another great photo opportunity here with the three of them together in the Milky Way, if you can bring it in on the shot as well. And while you're checking them out, uh, be sure that you pan over and take a look at the Milky Way uh, with binoculars, and uh, you'll be able to sh uh, see many wonderful objects in there, like the small and large Sagittarius star cloud that's set up in this area. Um, those are just millions of stars bound together by gravity as we stare into this area of the center of our galaxy, which is right around here. And uh, if we just pan a little bit over to uh, the uh, the left of the moon and look for four stars that make up a large square or a diamond in the sky, this is called the Great Square of Pegasus. Uh, you take the top left-hand star here, we count out two stars, and then up two stars. And right there to the right, right in that area there, is the beautiful Andromeda galaxy. It's actually so big that binoculars actually provide the best view. And if you can't find it using that method, look for the W shape here of Cassiopeia, right up here. And the second V and the W points directly down to Andromeda. And finally, uh, if you take a look at uh, the sky just below uh, the W here, Cassiopeia, make a long triangle. That's what I do, make a long triangle. And right in the center of those two stars down a distance, you'll find the beautiful double cluster, which is uh, simply spectacular in binoculars or a small telescope. So those are just a few of the night sky treasures that await you all week long as you pan through the sky with binoculars. So that's about all I get to say about that. That's all you got to say about that there. I'll get out of that one, and we'll stop sharing. So we're back. I think. We are. Okay. So... Paul is going to lead us in on next week's show. Paul has a lot of material to cover. Uh, on It's an undoubtedly a, a very um, involved topic. 
shooting the sky with your DSLR camera. And Paul's actually done some workshops uh, previously on um, on learning about the night sky through uh, your DSLR and, and how to shoot and process properly. Paul's an excellent astrophotographer, and uh, you you can learn a whole lot from Paul. So the idea I think is really to, is maybe to set this up as as a uh, as a full show workshop. Uh, with Paul being able to provide uh, answers to all the stuff that that uh, all the questions that you have. So if you have questions about shooting the sky with your DSLR camera, um, in 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 any way, shape, or form, have your questions preserved for next week, and we're going to give Paul the the whole show. Sound good to you, Mike? Yeah, because I'm working. Oh, you're working anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and I'm just going to sit back and drink coffee. I, I like it. <laughs> Okay, yeah. folks, so again, uh, apologies for the, the choppiness on uh, Facebook. I'm going to be working on that again this week. I am setting up a, an, a separate server that's going to allow me to simulcast directly. We did test it this week. The server works great, but the laptop that's feeding the server is working very poorly, as we can see. So uh, hoping to get that uh, all, all working and the new PC up and running uh, very soon. So hope you can bear with us. We do have an offering again on YouTube. The, the stream seems to be much better. So stick with us over there if you, if you, uh, if you wish. And I could un certainly understand, but I'm sure I'll, I'll get things, we'll get things back to where they, uh, where they should be very shortly. So I guess in uh, closing tonight, we'd like to thank all of you f again for your uh, continued support here. Remember guys, we do uh, love getting your photos again, so you can send them to Sunday night astronomy show at gmail.com and we will put them on the broadcast. Um, and also, please consider entering the current contest for a chance to win uh, some great prizes. The contest started on Tuesday night with the beginning of the new lunar cycle. We'd like to thank, again, uh, Next Dome Observatories and Mr. John Reed uh, from 50 Things a Series of Books for those donations. Very much appreciated. I remember, too, the contest doesn't end until September the 10th, so there's lots of time to submit your photos. And remember, it's any shot of the moon with any device and a capture of one of the planets to enter you into the second draw. You can send your entries to my Facebook page if you like, or you can send them here to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And we're also looking for suggestions for topics for future shows. Uh, Mike's topic and Paul's topic tonight, uh, which is going to be carried on to next week, uh, were both topics that were suggested by you. So this is why we're here as well. We want to, uh, to answer your questions. So if you have topics that you'd like us to discuss, please let us know, and we'll, we'll be happy to, uh, to dive into them for you. Uh, so other than that... Um, we also ask that if you enjoyed our content here tonight if you, and uh, you joined us from YouTube, if you could please consider giving us a like and maybe subscribing to our channel. And please let your family and friends know as well that we are here every Sunday night to uh, educate and entertain you <laughs> about the, uh, <laughs> always the entertainment part, about the night sky. So you for now, <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hold that. That's the entertaining part. Okay. So with that all then, folks, uh, from Mike and Paul and I, uh, stay safe, everybody out there, please. Uh, we wish you all very clear skies, and we hope to see you again here next week. And uh, remember, as we like to say here in the show, please keep your scopes pointed. Point it up. Point it up. up. <laughs> then we do that. Thanks, everybody. There we go. Then that's what we do. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Good night. Good night. See ya. <laughs>